when we think about capitalist markets, what we mean, what most business ethicists mean when they refer to such things, is locations where buyers and sellers can relatively freely engage with each other in order to exchange some sort of money or other compensation for a good or a service or a resource. And ideally, when capitalist markets are functioning at their best, there is mutual benefit that takes place at that moment of exchange. Okay, that's the ideal that all the theorists of capitalism at the beginning of this economic system back in the 18th century uh, focused on was that the buyers can benefit more from the product than they would otherwise be able to do, and the sellers can benefit more from the compensation than they would otherwise be able to do. So it is worth the while of both the buyers and the sellers to meet each other at whatever price point they agree upon. Okay, now, capitalist markets so described are incredible things. They are incredible because they disperse information in such an efficient way. If we were in a centralized economic system where the government allocated who would receive what resources and how, how much and how frequently and all of those other logistical details each year, we would be in a system where it would not be up to individual buyers and sellers whether they wanted to make a transaction or not. Okay? It would not be up to individual producers of goods how much to seek to produce. These sorts of things would be centrally determined. But in a capitalist system, the system is not centrally determined. That is, information does not flow from the middle out to the edges like a hub and spoke system would. Rather, in a capitalist system, Information is located in lots and lots of different places, and each individual is in charge, each individual business is in charge of what kinds of signaling mechanisms and what sorts of information exchanges he or she will focus on. So information is dispersed rather than centralized in a capitalist market, and this is an extraordinary thing. Okay, one of the great economic theorists of the 20th century was Friedrich Hayek. A name that you should definitely know, those of you who are business majors. Friedrich Hayek wrote uh, his most famous works in the middle of the 20th century at a time when market capitalism, as practiced here in the United States and in the West more generally, was still in heavy competition with other kinds of economic systems, including especially uh, socialism and more uh, you know, larger force, uh, communism. And Hayek argued that a capitalist market is a much more efficient way for a society to, to distribute its goods, its resources, its services than a centralized system, precisely because it utilizes the fact that each individual knows his own situation best. You know how much you want a particular resource. The government doesn't know that. And you can signal through the pricing mechanism where you meet some seller of that resource how much precisely you are willing to pay for that resource by virtue of the, uh, the pricing system, the, the capitalist market, Hayek argued, disperses information in a way that previous generations, previous economic system planners could only imagine. And this is an extraordinary strength of capitalist markets. Because of the incredible coordination capacities of capitalist markets, basically, these are, uh, these are social enterprises where each individual is empowered to be the judge in his own situation what and how much he wants something, or what and how much he's willing to work for. Because of the incredible coordination capacities of such systems, the 
capitalist way, as a way of thinking about life, has expanded in the last few decades. Okay, as the 20th century has gone on and basically capitalist markets have triumphed throughout the world over virtually every other economic system that they were competing against. This has led to an expansion of capitalist markets into other kinds of social coordination problems to attempt to solve these other social coordination problems. Okay, and so with that in mind, that little introduction, I want to start talking about the first chapter in Sandel's book, What Money Can't Buy. This is the chapter called Jumping the Queue. A queue is just a line, okay? If you stand up in line for a roller coaster at Six Flags, you are queuing up for it. Okay, and Sandel is interested in the way that markets can be used to solve the social coordination problem of line standing. Okay, lines occur in any society, wherever there is some scarce good that a large number of people want and that is not as readily available proportionally to the number of people that want it. Okay, so when Apple releases their latest iPhone, what are we on, iPhone 13 now? Is that the next model coming up, I believe? When Apple releases its iPhone 13, I guarantee you, opening day of retail sales at malls around Houston where Apple stores are located, there will be long queues out the door and probably several hundred yards long. Because in that moment, that small temporal time slice, there will be more demand than is capable of being satisfied. More people desire the product than the pro than is a than product that is available. Okay, proportionally speaking. So this is quite clearly a breakdown in social coordination. Wherever lines exist, there is some sort of a an inefficiency that is taking place in social coordination because we are not reaching some kind of a price point where the buyers and the sellers are happy and efficiently interacting with each other. Because the buyers, in the Apple example, have to wait sometimes for a long time, hours maybe. Okay, I remember when I was a kid growing up, uh, the Harry Potter book series was really big. J.K. Rowling was uh, putting that out. And these kids, these 13-year-olds, would stand in line for 10 hours to get the first edition of whatever book was latest coming out. Okay, pretty clearly something that cries out for a market-based solution. So Sandel in chapter one of, how, of What Money Can't Buy offers us several examples of lines and how markets can be used to resolve these. And he's using this as a, a way of exploring the moral strengths and weaknesses of markets. So we're going to abstract from these examples. We're going to list the examples, talk about the examples. And then we're going to abstract from the examples and talk more generally about what this says about capitalist markets. Okay, so um, example number one, airport security lines. We've all stood in such lines before, back before COVID when we could all travel. And some people, the ordinary people, stand in the long line. Other people, the fast-tracked people, get to go through a special pass line. And sometimes this is in the airport security line, sometimes this is in the plane boarding line, but the phenomenon is familiar. Those who are willing to pay for a special pass or who receive some sort of special privilege by virtue of being frequent flyers, that's frequent customers, get to go in the fast lane. While everybody else, the ordinary folks, gets to stand in the long lane. All the other people get to stand in the long lane. Okay, it's not the only phenomenon though where uh, lines take place. Another example that Sandel cites is um, tollways and HOV lanes. 
Here in Houston, we have toll passes. My wife and I own one. Toll passes ideally give you access on roads that will enable you to go faster than you would otherwise have to go. Okay, if you're able to bypass the ordinary folks traffic jam, then what you are doing is you are paying in money for the sake of time. You are uh, choosing the faster way because it is more valuable to you to save your time than to save the money that could presumably be saved in such a situation by foregoing the tollway or the HOV pass. Okay, um, that's not the only uh, example of this, and I'll also cite doctor appointments. Okay, uh, some of us know this already. Others of us, as you get out into the world and sign up for doctor appointments, especially new patient appointments with general physicians or other kinds of doctor specialists, you have to wait. You have to wait sometimes for a long time. Sometimes if the doctor is especially popular, it takes months to get a new patient appointment. And what Sandell talks about is actually a market-based solution, which has arisen to try to resolve this social coordination problem. That market-based solution is the existence of concierge doctors. Concierge doctors are doctors by subscription. A concierge doctor is a doctor who says, look, I'm going to cap my practice at 600 patients. But each of those 600 patients is going to pay a $10,000 fee each year. And for that $10,000 fee, they basically get immediate access to the doctor. You don't have to stand in line for a month or two or three. And you get immediate access because you have paid up front for a special pass. Again, a pass that signals that it is more valuable to you to have immediate doctor availability than to pay in time by waiting several months to get that appointment. One final example that I want to cite uh, from the Sandel chapter before stepping back and thinking about more generally the, the, I, the philosophical topics that are raised here is the line standing business example that he cites. Okay, he uses New York City. We could just as easily use Houston. In New York City, they have Shakespeare in the Park each year in Central Park. Okay, we do too in Houston, actually. I highly encourage you guys, while you're here in Houston, some of us have come from far away. This is a great public opportunity for public theater. It's in Herman Park in the Miller Outdoor Theater. They have two performances every year. My wife and I never miss it. Okay, um, in New York City, Shakespeare in the Park is free. And this means that it's in high demand. Because the cheaper the product, more generally, the higher the demand. And especially if you ever see that printed word free, people go crazy when they see that. People who would not pay 10 cents for something will jump on board if that word says free, when 10 cents is virtually free. It's crazy what free does. Okay, and in New York City, you have to get tickets, but it is free. And a lot of professionals who work all day want to see Shakespeare in the evening, but they don't have time to stand in the line that forms because the tickets are free. And so what they do is they employ people to stand in line for them. Okay, and actually people run businesses, line standing businesses, where they have employees who stand in line for professionals. Okay, you've heard of um, personal shoppers. Well, there are personal line standers too. Employees who will stand in line for professionals. And the numbers that send all sites are, I think if I remember correctly, $125 an hour. I think I'd stand in line for numbers like that. Uh, but so for these professionals who work all day in financial office buildings and the like, it is more valuable to them to have that time than to have the $125.
But they also want to see Shakespeare in the evening, and so they employ other people to stand in line for them. Okay, here we have four examples of cues or line standing phenomena. And as I mentioned at the outset, generally speaking, lines are a sign of a social breakdown of some kind. It's a sign of a lack of efficient dispersal of resources. Airport lines, where some people are ha have to stand in the longer line while others, because they pay for the special pa pass, can go quickly. Tollway lanes, where some people have to wait in the long um, line on the highway while others can pay for a special pass to go quickly. Doctor appointments, where some people have to wait. Others pay for a special pass to go quickly. And then the line standing business, where some people employ others in order to be able to obtain the scarce good without having to stand in the line, thus providing a market-based solution to the line standing problem. Okay, let's step back and think for just a minute more generally about what this expansion of market-based thinking into these uh, social coordination, difficult, difficult social coordination areas says about markets more generally. Okay, so let's now think about capitalist markets in terms of their moral strengths and weaknesses. And what this says about the economic system in which all of us, of course, are going about to go out into. Um, and participate in. Let's focus on strengths first. Who benefits, what demographic groups benefit from the market-based solutions that I've just described to these social coordination problems? Frankly, wealthy people. wealthy people, yeah. Is it just the wealthy? Who else benefits? Oh, yes, there are those as well. Yes, we have special provisions for them. That's true, Keisha. I was thinking also, though, of the provider of the good, the seller. But you're absolutely right. You're totally right. We do have special provisions for those who don't have wealth but who have special circumstances in most of these cases. It is in the interests of the county to offer tollway passes because they make money. They can presumably pump that back into the highways as long as there isn't a slush fund. It's in the interest of doctors to offer concierge, some doctors to offer concierge services because they can make more money. So the wealthy benefit, the sellers of the goods benefit. They wouldn't sell such goods if they didn't, after all. Okay, and maybe to add to what Brinkley said a little bit, it's not just the wealthy who benefit, it's the people who are willing and able to pay. Okay, and often that's the wealthy. But often if it's not a really expensive uh, resource, people of normal means, if they want the resource badly enough, can signal their desire to have the resource by paying extra to get it, get it quickly, to get it um, in a, a, a more efficient way than they would otherwise do. Okay, so one clear strength of capitalist markets is they maximize efficiency. And by efficiency, what I'm especially talking about is the utility index for buyers and sellers. The utility index for buyers and sellers. Um, if you think of it in terms of maximizing personal utility, if it is in your interests to pay in money rather than time, a market-based solution gives you the freedom to do that. It gives you the opportunity to do that. It maximizes your personal utility by providing you with options. Okay, um, if it is in your interest 
to sell a particular resource. The market-based solution gives sellers the opportunity to do that, to maximize their utility. Okay, and in maximizing utility, the society as a whole, you know, you guys have got to stop me when I'm making sewing mistakes. <laughs> I, I talk when I lecture and I like write on the board at the same time, and usually this works out, but sometimes it like massively fails. My brain automatically Your brain automatically fixes yeah, it? <laughs> Have I missed any others? Okay, that all looks good. All right, fair enough. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Some of you guys are just now waking up and paying attention. So. All right. Um. So, yeah, so society as a whole has a more maximal efficiency when each individual in society is able to achieve the best possible personal utility, okay, or each business in society is able to achieve the best possible personal utility. Okay, um, a second pretty clear moral strength of markets is that they maximize liberty. They give people freedom where previously there was no freedom, or maybe not freedom, not enough freedom. Let me read Sandel's words uh, to you guys on these topics. This is on page 29 for when you were able to open up the text and read this first chapter. The case for markets over cues, Sandel writes, draws on two arguments. One is about respecting individual freedom, and the other is about maximizing welfare or social utility. Okay, he's going to do the freedom argument first. The first is a, a libertarian argument, a freedom-based argument. It maintains that people should be free to buy and sell whatever they please as long as they don't violate anyone's rights. The second argument for markets is utilitarian. It says that market exchanges benefit buyers and sellers alike, thereby improving our collective well-being or social utility. The fact that my line stander and I strike a deal proves that we are both better off as a result. Paying $125 to see the Shakespeare play without having to wait in line must make me better off, otherwise I wouldn't have hired the line stander. And earning $125 by spending hours in a queue must make the line stander better off, Otherwise, he or she wouldn't have taken the job. Free markets then allocate goods in an extraordinarily efficient way. They allow people to make mutually advantageous trades and thus allocate goods to those who value them most highly as measured by their willingness to pay. Okay, there's some other moral strengths of markets. If we have time, we'll get to that. But I want to talk a little bit now about the weaknesses here, moral weaknesses of markets. And maybe it might help us to think of it in terms of who doesn't benefit from the market-based solution to these social coordination problems. So let's go back to these. What demographic groups don't benefit from market-based solutions to these things? Frankly. Those who don't have the means, yeah. Those who are unwilling or unable to pay for the special services. So how should we express this? Well, there are a couple of different kinds of people that uh, we could say are, are in mind here. Okay, one quite clearly is the, the impoverished. Okay, and another is those people who have means, we wouldn't maybe call them impoverished, but they don't have enough means to be able to signal maybe that they want a faster doctor appointment. They prefer to spend their means on other things. Okay, so that we could think of it in terms of two groups of people, both of whom don't have the ability to pay. One doesn't have any means at all. The other has means, just not enough. When I was a little kid, my dad used to take me to Texas Ranger games. Okay, I was a big Rangers fan. I was such a big Rangers fan that I actually had memorized 
from day to day the batting averages of the Rangers starting lineup. I also had the pitcher ERAs memorized. I was a crazy big baseball fan. Okay, I'm still a baseball fan. Not that crazy now. I've got some other things on my mind, like a bunch of kids, including my pregnant wife. Okay. Um, but my dad would take me to baseball games. And I get to occasionally, maybe twice a year, see the Rangers play in person. Where do you think we sat in the stadium? Nosebleed in the outfield. Third deck, as far as we could be. Binoculars territory. My dad was a good, indulgent father, but he didn't have the means at that time. He was just establishing his dental practice and didn't have a large client base. He didn't have the means at that time to be able to pay for good seats. So there I was sitting in the outfield, far, far away from the action. And you know what? At those stadium, at the stadium at that time, the Rangers have actually been through two stadiums since then. <laughs> that shows you how old I am. And also how America seems to be wasting money on sports stadiums. Uh, in the stadium at that time, there were a lot of other people who got to sit on the first and third base lines real close to the action. They paid a lot more for their seats. Do you think they wanted to see the game close up more than I did, nine-year-old me? No. I think I had a stronger desire to see the game close up than they did. But the market-based solution doesn't reward those who have the strongest desire. Market-based solution rewards those who have the desire, but more importantly, the means. Okay, so arguably markets discriminate against two groups of people, the impoverished and the, uh, those with moderate wealth who don't want to spend their wealth on uh, market-based advantages. Markets discriminate against <clears throat> the less prosperous, we'll say. Notice, though, that generally speaking, markets are pretty good at giving people the ability to signal how much they want a particular good or service or resource. Okay, by rewarding those who are willing to pay, markets are giving people an opportunity to use the pricing mechanism to signal how badly they want a particular good. Okay, there are maybe other ways we could signal how badly we want a particular good. I don't know, they, I think they'd all be less efficient than markets. We could jump up and down and holler as loudly as possible, and those who holler the loudest, signaling that they want it the most, could get the good in question. And maybe there are other ways that we could do it. But generally speaking, it's pretty hard to beat a pricing system as a way of discerning how badly people actually want something. It's pretty hard to beat a pricing system, but pricing systems are not perfect. And pricing systems discriminate against people like nine-year-old me who didn't have means, wanted real badly to see the game, but didn't have means to do so. I've been talking for a little while, I realize. Let me stop and I'm gonna list some more moral weaknesses momentarily, but are there any questions or comments so far? I realize I haven't been stopping for questions. Questions or comments? Everybody awake? Good, good, good. Did you know that in socialist countries, the lines are much, much worse? Because they don't have a pricing mechanism to enable people to signal how badly they want a particular good. So without the ability of the price to rise to a particular level, to you know, meet the demand number at that magic special price point where it's efficient, 
Socialist countries instead require people to pay in time. They don't pay in money, they pay in personal time. And the lines for toilet paper or for grocery shopping or for um, other scarce goods are incredibly long. Okay, um, I want to talk briefly about a second moral weakness. This is the corruption uh, criticism. Markets corrupt. what they touch. Suppose that you're my old friend and I'm coming into town on a business trip and you find out and you um, you want to do lunch with me. Okay, actually, let's set it up this way. Suppose I call you up and I say, will you do lunch with me, my old friend? Okay, so I've called you. And you say, yeah, yeah, I'd love to, but you know, I've got some, I've got some other things going on, but I'll try to make time so that I can uh, have lunch with you, you know what friends do to cherish each other, good friendships, right? I'll try to make time for you. But what if I say to you on the phone, well, I'll make it more your, worth your while. I'll pay you $170 to have lunch with me, okay? Suddenly, the dynamic of old friends meeting for lunch has taken on a very different kind of a nature, hasn't it? Can someone describe for us what happens when money enters the equation like it did in that moment? What has taken place there? Okay. Changes their incentive. They're no longer incentivized by friendship, a non-monetary kind of a consideration. Now it's just an exchange of cash that's going on. Anybody else? What changed when I offered $170? His reason for having lunch with me, yeah, yeah. A lot of critics of market-based solutions to social coordination problems allege that actually whenever market-based solutions enter the equation, they corrupt the things that they touch. The fact that money is involved corrupts the good in question. Okay, so think about it this way. All of us probably have thought about marrying in life. And we've thought about who, you know, the sort of person we'd ideally like to marry. Suppose the following scenario. Suppose you're looking at a potential marriage prospect, maybe going out on some dates with a potential marriage prospect. And this person is not ideal in the way that you were imagining, but this person is not terrible either. Okay, maybe um, we're looking at a person who's pretty lazy you're looking at a messy house going forward. Doesn't really help that much with kids. I mean, not gonna cheat on you or anything, just, you know, mediocre. Not really emotionally, like, strong and vibrant. Okay, just kind of living alongside you. Okay, just kind of mediocre. And you think to yourself, well, you know, I guess I could settle or I could hold out for more. But then you find out that this person has money. Real money, lots of it. 
How much would it take? How much of that money would it take for you to be willing to marry a less than ideal candidate? For you to be willing to settle? Again, this person's not going to cheat on you. Okay? But this person is definitely settling. One million. Who would settle for one million? Tatiana, you would? <laughs> well said. Um, five? Morris, five million? You can do a lot with five million, can't you? Yeah, you can like quit your quit your job. You know, go get some vacations in the Bahamas. Go on. Those of you who already jumped are now regretting your choice. Twenty million? Rinko, you'd settle for twenty. Joaquin, you'd settle for twenty. Some of us are not settling. Some of us are really holding out. One billion dollars. Who's going to settle for a billion dollars? Kevin, you settle? Joaquin, you've already settled. <laughs> you haven't settled, man. You will now for a billion? <laughs> you know what? We all had a price, didn't we? Some of us didn't. Some of us are like, nope, marriage is beyond price. Sure cheapened it, though, when I started hawking it like is at an auction. Didn't it feel like dirty and, you know, shouldn't be what marriage is like. Shouldn't be just a financial transaction. Money corrupts what it touches. Why does it corrupt it? Well, because it makes it about self-interest. Because there's nothing that more clearly expresses self-interest than making money from something. Okay, and relationships like friendships or like marriage, which ideally in their best moments, ought to be about care for others beyond self-interest. They ought to be about something larger than just self-interest. They suddenly are brought into the calculus of self-interest by the fact of the monetary exchange. By the way, this whole idea of um, money for marriage is a tried and true way of doing marriage. Like a lot of people actually approach it that way. It's not as though this is a rare phenomenon. Um, and it's not just the trophy wives either, where it's money for sex. Uh, if you look back at the history of marriage, it's only recently that marriage has been seen as this um, institution based on romantic love. If you dial the date back a couple centuries, what you find is most marriages are actually based on, um, on financial provision and on family ties, kinship ties, things that are not just ro about romantic love. Frankly? Yeah, man, all that whole dowry thing, it was about cold, hard cash. That is exactly what that was about. <laughs> um, so this is actually not a rare phenomenon, okay? All right, um, Sandel cites some examples of things that are potentially corrupted by markets. Consider the following examples. Let me just read from the text, let him speak for himself. Here's one, um, scarce campsites at Yosemite National Park in California. Yosemite National Park in California attracts more than 4 million visitors a year. About 900 of its prime campsites can be reserved in advance at a cost of just $20 per night. Demand is so intense, especially for the summer, that the campsites are fully booked within minutes of becoming available. Ticket scalpers have gotten a hold of the situation. And Yosemite campsites go for sale on Craigslist for $100 to $150 per night. So that's a five to, uh, to seven or eight time markup. The National Park Service has been flooded with complaints about the scalpers and has tried to prevent the illicit trade. The public outrage over the scalping of Yosemite campsites rejects the logic of the market. Okay, a lot of people feel as though Yosemite Park campsites ought to be beyond price. Okay, the newspaper headlines said things like, 
Scalpers strike Yosemite Park is nothing sacred. The wonders of Yosemite belong to all of us, an editorial stated, not just to those who can afford to fork over extra cash to a scalper. So that's one example of something that people, uh, a lot of people, non-economic types, probably most of us in this room, business majors that we are, are going to be like, yeah, a market-based solution to the Yosemite camping problem. Okay, but non-economic types out there are going to be like, this is a sacred good. You shouldn't mess with it. Okay, or here's another one. Papal masses. When Pope Benedict XVI made his first visit to the United States, demand for tickets to his stadium masses in New York City and Washington, D.C. far exceeded the supply of seats. Free tickets were distributed through Catholic dioceses and local parishes. Ticket scalping ensued. <laughs> as people collected the free tickets from the local parishes and resold them online. Sometimes for more than $200. A church spokeswoman said, there shouldn't be a market in tickets. You can't pay to celebrate the sacrament with the Pope. Okay. Some of us are still like, yeah, the market-based solution to taking the sacrament. Okay. I won't out you, those of you who are the hardcore business types. Okay, but the point is just this. Arguably markets corrupt what they touch by virtue of rendering relationships and social interactions that were supposed to be about things beyond price by rendering them now about price and more particularly about the obtaining of self-interested advantages with price as the signaling mechanism. Questions or comments about the corruption criticism? Do you guys agree with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not always corrupting. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, not always corrupting, sure. Yeah. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. The self-interest, though, is what is being expressed by the money. Okay. I'll leave you guys with a funny story. Okay. When I was in high school, uh, I played in uh, the local orchestra at my um, local high school. Burleson High School in Burleson, Texas. And uh, we all got to know members of the cast. Everybody knew everybody. It was a small high school. And uh, one of the members of the cast regularly, she played in a lot of performances, was Kelly Clarkson. And of course, she was just a normal high school student at the time. And everybody signed everybody's program. And, you know, we all signed each other's, like, uh, shirts and stuff like that, right? Okay, so she hits it big through American Idol, and the next day, I hocked all the merchandise on eBay and got, like, thousands for it. It's totally, like, a complete, like, corruption of the former friendship. So, <laughs> it's uh, it's emblematic of what I'm talking about here. It makes it about something different than just, uh, just friendship. I hope she's done well. She was headed down the road.